All right, so we're at the starting point of our program, and I know that some people will continue to join uh, as we get started, but we know that some of you have kids who are waiting, and we know that they get restless after a while, so we're going to go on and get started. Um, so welcome, I'm Susan Bonfield, I'm with Environment for the Americas, and thank you for joining us for the third story time in celebration of World Migratory Bird Day, Birds Connect Our World. Definitely it's connecting our world. We have Ryan from Maryland and Paisley from California and Joshua and people from as far away as Northern Ireland. So thank you so much for joining us for our story time. As always, I wanna give a few instructions. Um, you can contact us after this program at the email that you see on the screen, which is info at environmentamericas.org. And of course, for future programs, please check us out on migratorybirdday.org uh, forward slash bird day live or visit our other programs on the web. Um, today, we're going to learn about the word endemic. We're gonna learn about plastics and how they can harm birds. We're gonna learn how you can be the solution to plastic pollution. And then we're gonna have, we have a scavenger game. And of course, we're going to meet Gabby the crab eating goal. And as I told some of the folks who came on earlier, I brought a goal in to join the story with us today because I can't be with you in person. We also have an expert who will be joining us today. Uh, doc Dr. Greg Butcher It will be on the line and at the end of the program, he'll answer any questions. So at the end of the program, if your child is getting restless, the question and answer part of the program is the last part. So that's a time where if your child is getting restless, you can go on and sign off. And if they wanna stay on, of course, we're happy to entertain their questions. So let's get started. First, we're gonna talk a little bit about plastics. Plastics are a big part of our world. We use them every day and we use them in so many ways that sometimes now, I think we don't even notice that we are using plastic items. But for birds and for other wildlife, it can be different. Plastics can actually harm birds and other wildlife. This is an example of a gull, and it's not the gull that we're going to talk about today, but a different kind of gull. But this is a gull with a, with a snack bag. And perhaps the gull smelled something yummy inside the snack bag, or perhaps it saw the bag and it thought it was food. Whatever the reason, if the bird eats this bag, it can, it can impact its health. It can affect its stomach and its digestion and its ability to survive. Birds can also become tangled in plastics, especially plastics that get wrapped around their feet, their wings, or their beaks. And so unfortunately, that can also affect a bird's ability to eat or to fly or to walk. Birds may also mistake plastics as nest material. This bird is using netting in its nest and that netting can become very dangerous for it and its young. The young can become entangled when they hatch from the eggs, or the adult can be tangled up in the net also. So this is very dangerous for a bird. So now I want you, I'm gonna give you three minutes and we're gonna do a quick scavenger hunt. And you can do it wherever your parents say that you can do this. You can do it in the room where you are now and just stay in that same room, or you can go a little farther, but I'm only going to give you three minutes. What I'd like you to do is bring back three to five items that are plastic that you use in your home. Try not to bring something huge, maybe just something that you can carry easily. But when I say go, I'm gonna let you get up and go find those three items or five items. When you come back, we're gonna share what you found. You can put that in the question box or I will have three people share it um, on the audio. So are you ready? Get set, go. Some of you might be fast, so if you're already back, you can start putting your answers in the question box.
someone says no. I'm going to be very interested to see what you come up with. All right, we've already got some people coming back with some great examples of plastics. Ooh, here's a long list. I'll give everybody another minute before I start sharing them and reading them off. And I see that some people are already asking questions. Juwan, I'm gonna give you to the expert at the end of the program and you can ask Dr. Greg Butcher that question. Oh, wow. Okay, we're getting a lot of answers. This is great, you guys. All right, you have about 30 seconds left. Whoa. Look at all those answers. Okay, do we think we have everybody back? It looks like we might. I have such a long list of the answers. So here we go. I'm going to start reading them and I'm sure as people start returning, uh, then they'll hear some more. So we have a plastic bag, a plastic bottle, plastic beads, pin, hand sanitizer and a toy, a plastic Brita pitcher, grocery bag for veggies, a plastic jar for spices, a sippy cup and a tub, a balloon, a plastic cup, a plastic toy, a plastic bag, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. I have one person who says they can't hear. A Ziploc baggie, a milk jug, a Nintendo Switch pad, a Tupperware container. Would anybody like to answer live? If you would, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Not yet. So, oh, Juwan. Juwan definitely wants to speak. Juwan, I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to let you share what plastics you found. Hopefully I'm saying your name right. All right, you're on Juwan and I can hear you. So if you would like to share in person, you can speak everybody what you found that's plastic in your house. Are you there Juwan? Okay, we'll wait for Juwan and I'll go on and read. Allie found a game controller, a cup, a princess dress up shoe, and the Marsh family found a chip clip and a plastic car. We've got soap bottles and toy boats and water bottles and ring pack thingies. So the amount of plastics that we have in our home is just incredible. So what I would like for you to do is I'd like for you to think about that. Um, the number of plastics that you have before we continue on with the crab eating goal. So this is the crab eating goal in real life. And the crab eating goal is a goal that um, like its name eats, eats crabs, but it's actually called the Olrog's goal. That's its real official name. And the crab eating goal is special in one sense, which is that it's an endemic species. And endemic means that it's only found in a certain part of the world. So a very small part of the world, which is down in Argentina. And you can see where the dot is on our map, that it isn't very found in very many places. And that's what it means to be endemic, only found in a specific geographical location. So now we are going to read the story of the crab eating goal. And this story, is by Nicholas Tizio and Tito Naraski, and the art is by Carlos Goyez uh, from Argentina, where this goal lives. So sit down and relax, and let's start our story.
we're going to start our story on page six. There's a little bit of information in front about the artists and their work in Argentina. And as you can see, the words themselves are in Spanish, but I'm going to read the story in English. If you want to come and do the story later in Spanish, then we'll be hosting that event at 1230. So here we go. Gabby, who we see here, and even if we don't say, is a crab-eating gull and a common bird she ain't. We took a trip to a faraway place to see our friend Gabby on the beach looking for crabs. There she is. There is Gabby. She looks like a kelp gull, and although smaller, it's hard to tell them apart. Not an easy task it is, but it's no good to rush these things. We think that this drawing, a good one indeed, will help whoever wants to know which gull she really is. Gabby wears a simple outfit, just black and white, but perhaps you've noticed that her tail sports a black stripe. And if you pay attention, you'll see that there are two different colored dots on her beak and not just one, like her friend, the kelp gull's beak. No other gull like this will you find at sea, and that is why she's endemic to Argentina. You can only find her here. To get to where she'll nest, we had to take a boat through the deep and calm blue sea. We paddled hard, and we were lucky to arrive at this island that you see. And we were quite happy to be in the area where the gulls breed. Almost side by side, all the gulls were sitting on their nests. The eggs we saw were colored olive green with brown specks. The group of gulls saw us and soon loudly complained as if they were saying to us, hey, this is not your place. Once we learned we were not wanted, we decided to obey. So right away, we boarded our boat and bid farewell from afar. And we heard their advice. When we care for our nests, you should stay away and far. Saying hello, quite excited, not much later, we saw Gabby, as she happily showed us her babies very proudly. Be informed that outside the country, they don't breed anywhere else. So we must take care of their future and care for what we have. We will never forget what we saw by the sea. And we are sure to tell everyone who'd like to hear. Remember, along with us, while the story comes to an end, that the crab-eating gull should be treated like our friend. The end. And that is the story of the crab-eating gull. Now, I want you to go back to what you remember about the story and about what we talked about in terms of plastics. And I want you to think about plastics and how you can make choices at home. One of the things that has affected Gabby the gull and other gulls in Argentina and other places are plastics and other, other things that fishermen throw away or other people throw away that they can't digest or that causes them to become entangled. So let's play a quick game and see how you do. Let's choose which is the best to use. So tell me, which is better to use when you're taking water with you for a trip? A plastic water bottle, a plastic reusable water bottle, which is B, or a metal water bottle?
Number one, um, or letter A, the plastic bottle, you'll probably only use once. So that's not a good choice. A good choice is a reusable, re reusable water bottle. And the best choice is a water bottle that's not plastic and it's reusable also. How are you guys doing on the questions? You can also put these in the question box so that I can see how you're doing with the questions and get some of your answers. Let's do another one. All right, what is better? A reusable bag, a paper bag, or a plastic bag? I'll let you think about that. Which is better? Definitely a reusable bag is best because you can reuse it for a long time and you never need to get another bag. A paper bag is also good. It can be, it can biodegrade. That means it can fall apart without harming anything. You can also reuse it. And which is the worst is the plastic bag. This is the bag that you're likely to throw away. And this is the bag that if the goal eats it, it will be harmed. All right. And lastly, where would you put your sandwich? Would you put your sandwich in a beeswax bag, beeswax bag, a plastic bag, or in a metal tin that you could reuse? Definitely a beeswax bag is good. A plastic bag for your sandwiches, not so good because you're likely to throw that away. And for sure, the tin containers or the containers that you can continue to use is one of the best options for you. And now here's our last question. So how are you doing? All right, we have plastic straws. We have straws that are made out of bamboo and we have metal straws. Which would you choose? All right, we have some saying metal. Forrest McKinney out there says metal. Danielle says metal. Um, this might be the parents. Good for you guys. Definitely the choice that you don't want to make is something that you would throw away after just one use, like the plastic straws. You want to use something that you can reuse, like the bamboo straws, or something that you can reuse forever and continue to clean, like the metal straws. So good job, everybody. I see your answers in the pane. And when you put your answers in, if you could remind me of your name, I can put that in too. So thanks to Eli, who says metal, and Eloise, who also says metal, and Natalie Dumier, because uh, who also said metal. So before I turn you over to the expert to ask any of your questions, um, I want to remind you that we have story time every week and you're welcome to join. We have the next two sessions already up on the web and you can register for them again at migratorybirdday.org forward slash birdday live. And now I'm going to turn you over to Dr. Greg Butcher, who's going to answer your questions. So now is your time to put your questions in the, in the question box and we can open up the be ready with your audio to unclick your mute button so that you can ask your question live or you can put the question in the question box and we'll answer that. So let me bring Dr. Greg Butcher on. I will unmute him. Greg, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, I gotta warn you that these guys ask some really hard questions. Okay, I'll do my best. Okay, one of the first questions came from Juwan who wanted to know, what is a gull? Oh, okay, so a gull is a bird, and it's a very specialized kind of bird that is usually found near the water. And so some people call them seagulls. But it turns out that not all the gulls are found by water. Some of them actually go inland and eat insects in farmers' fields. So that's why we call them gulls and not seagulls all the time. But a gull is a special kind of bird related to a tern or a shorebird. And um, the great thing about gulls, they're found anywhere all around the world. And even though Gabby is only found in Argentina, there are birds that look a lot like Gabby almost anywhere 
tell where there's a, an ocean or a coast coastline. All right, thank you, Greg. And thanks, Juwan, for that great question. I know that people are hearing a clicking sound and it seems to be associated with Greg's telephone. So we'll just have to um, deal with that for a little while. So I, we have some more questions. Uh, Greg, I told you, this we're gonna ask some hard questions. They wanna know how long do birds live? And why don't we just focus on Gabby the Gull? Well, let me just say overall, the bigger the bird, the longer it lives. And so Gabby the Gull is actually a pretty good sized gull. And we can live like 25 years if it's really lucky. As long as it doesn't get entangled in plastic, it could live up to 25 years old. All right. Ruby wants to know, how do you get plastics out of birds? Do they go to the doctor? Yeah, so it, um, if you see a bird entangled in plastic, you can call a wildlife rehabilitator. And um, you can Google that and they'll find your location and they'll give you the phone number of someone who's a specialist in catching birds that need help. And yes, they go to a veterinarian, which is an animal doctor, and the veterinarian can untangle them and then send them right back where they used to live. And some, some of the birds recover really, really well, even after they've been entangled. Thanks, Greg. Oh, wow, you have some great questions. Carson Ratliff wants to know, what's the fastest land bird? The fastest what? Land bird. Oh, that would be an ostrich. Uh, so the ostrich, you know, is big and they have long legs and they can move those legs so fast you wouldn't even believe it. There's no way I could ever catch an ostrich if it started running. <laughs> so I'm so glad you're on, Greg, because you are the expert. Um, Ella wants to know, why does Gabby only live in Argentina? So there are other kinds of gulls and because Gabby specializes only in crabs, sometimes the other gulls can have eat more and uh, be bigger and stronger, like the kelp gull shares the habitat with Gabby, but the kelp gull is bigger and stronger and can live more places than Gabby can because Gabby specializes in a special kind of crab. And so we have that with all kinds of birds. Some birds are specialists with very small areas where you can find them, and other birds are more generalist and are found almost everywhere. So this is a personal question, Greg. Tuvia wants to know what your favorite bird is. That's the hardest question anybody ever asked me. I can answer all those other questions. I'm not sure I can answer this question because what I like about birds is there's so many different kinds. There are 10,000 different kinds of birds and every one of them looks different from every other one. But because it's springtime, I'll tell you that my favorite bird is the Baltimore Oriole, and you can see those in the eastern United States in the springtime, and I'm waiting to see my very first one this spring. I'll have to remember that. And Greg, okay. are dinosaurs? Say that again? Are birds dinosaurs? Yes. Who knew that? Somebody knew the answer to that question. Birds <laughs> are flying dinosaurs. Birds are flying dinosaurs. And in the old days, millions of years ago, there were dinosaurs that had feathers. And some of those dinosaurs that had feathers became birds with feathers. And so um, all those dinosaurs with feathers were closely related to all the birds that still live with feathers. So yes, birds are dinosaurs. And if somebody tells you no, people don't understand that. So if somebody tells you no, you might not be able to convince them. <laughs> and, and it's hard to think about. Mateo wants to know, how do we keep plastics from hurting birds? Well, the best way is to use as few plastics as you can. Um, sometimes if you go to the beach, if it's a wild beach, you can bring a, a black garbage bag with you and you can pick up some of the plastics you see on the beach and put them in the bag and throw them in a real garbage can. And if you use plastic at your home, be sure to recycle them. So I want to take this moment to say a special hello to Leah, Ava, and Harrison in Oradell, New Jersey. And 
One thing I know is at their house, anytime they use plastics, they recycle them so that they go through the garbage stream and they don't end up on the beach. Excellent. So everybody remember the game we played with the choices you can make about what you use and what you use in your house and also outside. And that's a big way that you can help birds and other wildlife. So I'll end with two more questions, Greg, and then we'll end our story time. Um, several people have asked, the Stark family and some others have asked, why do seagulls live far away from the water like in Illinois? So they're not really seagulls. So they're more common by the water. There's more species that stay near the water, but there's several species of gulls that love to go inland. And one of the real common ones all through the United States and Canada is called ring-billed gull. And it does have its nest near water, but when it's hungry, it goes out over land and it finds flying insects. So there's a special gull in the United States, it's called California gull. And the California gull is also found in Utah. And more than 150 years ago, the farmers in Utah were devastated because these big grasshoppers called locusts were starting to eat all their crops. And then one day, a big flock of California gulls came over and started eating the locusts and saved the crop. And so everybody in Utah loves the California gull because it saves the crops by eating the locusts in the farmer's field. Thank you. So here's a good one, and we'll end on this one. Grayson wants to know, why do the gulls have red on their beak? Ah, that's a great question. So a lot of gulls have red on their beak. Some, the ring-billed gull has a black ring on its beak. Some gulls have red and black dots on the beak. And what it is, it's a message to their partner. And so it's a way of sort of looking a little bit attractive um, so that uh, the male and the female gulls can get together and have a family. Good answer. I, I think that red is pretty cool. So I want to thank oh, you for, <laughs> yeah, for being our expert of the day. We couldn't have done it Any without time. You. Yes. And I want to thank all of you for joining the story time today. We hope you can make it again next week. And again, please feel free to send us a message or to ask any questions via our email address and to stay tuned for the next show. So thank you so much for joining and listening to the story of Gabby the Gull. Thank you, everybody. All right, I will end the webinar.